Hey, folks, welcome to a very special edition of the Small Business Show. I really think you're going to like this one, right, Dave? I I enjoy I enjoyed this interview that you are about to hear so much. Uh, what a great conversation we had with Evan Samet, who he'll explain yeah. his piece in the live entertainment industry. But what an industry to talk about right now. Right now. That's yeah. Right. And, and so many small businesses are suffering out there. Uh, and, you know, you, you couldn't pick one that was hit harder, you know, than this event and ticketing. Uh, shut type down? Thing. Maybe. Yeah. yeah just, just shut down. So he's got a great story. And, you know, he's a listener that that reached out to us. And uh, we, we always love these, uh, you know, opportunities to connect with folks that are listening to us. Um, before we start the show. Do us a favor, pause, unless you're driving, uh, pause, pause your podcast here and go leave us a, a review up at your podcast directory of choice. We don't have nearly enough of them. They help us out. They help us bring in better guests. Uh, we would appreciate it. It would make our Thanksgiving tremendously better if you could leave us one of those reviews. Yeah, it, re it really does help us. Uh to, to, to grow the show and that grows the small business show family, which is good right. for you as a listener and, and all of us. So yeah, we please that review would help a lot. So yeah, that's, a, and that's one of the things I, I really loved uh, about Avin Evan is when the mistake that he made that he talked about with mm. the company he founded, you know, it, it is, it's, it just reverberates through his entire life and all the, the things. And we've talked about similar things on the show before, but it's a, it's really a, a great insight. And I know that everyone is going to really enjoy towards the end of the show as we talk about that mistake. I think so. I certainly appreciated it. And it, it rang true with me for sure, as you'll hear. Indeed. So, yep. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I, that's all I want to get to this interview unless you've yeah, got something I'm ready else. To, no, I'm, I'm ready to small business, man. I'm ready to small business too. He's Shannon Jean. I'm Dave Hamilton. And this is episode 304 of the Small Business Show. You know, there's nothing better than having a small business show listener reach out to us with a request to be on the show, right, Dave? I it's the best. Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about it all the time, especially when they have good stories. To yeah, tell, exactly. Which so, I think is the case. <laughs> so, so recently, I was contacted by a listener via LinkedIn with a, com a really compelling message about his experience starting and selling a small business, but also really about the challenges of being in the ticketing and live event business that was completely shut down due to COVID. Um, Evan Samet, he, he founded Ticket Insider in 2013, had some great success, sold the company in 2018. He's now Evan's now the VP of Purchasing and Marketing at Key Investment Group, which is another ticketing and VIP experiencing company on a large scale. And he's been through a lot. And I'm just so glad, you know, Evan, thank you for joining us today, giving me all the feedback uh, when you reached out. We're really happy to have you here. Thanks guys for having me on. I'm, you know, I've been looking forward and obviously reached out to you. I'm excited to, you know, share my story and, you know, talk about the live entertainment business. Yeah, it's yeah. A, that's, that's a, that's one that's near and dear to my heart. Listeners know I'm a drummer too. And, and even though I don't draw my revenue from that these days, uh, or my primary revenue, it, it it's definitely a, a business that's been hit perhaps harder than any other, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah. So let's, let's get a little bit of background here for our listeners and talk about, um, how you got in the ticketing and the event business, uh, you know, back in 2013. So I started the business, you know, from my college dorm room. Uh, I had tickets to go to a show that was playing at a local club. I went to uh, Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. So it's playing, nice. you know, down the street in New Haven. Was and it Toad's Place? It was actually Toad's Place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've played there a few times. It's a fun club. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good time. And I bought the tickets. I lived with, you know, seven other people at the time. So I bought the tickets for eight of us. I'm sorry, for the seven plus myself. And for whatever reason, I don't even remember the reason we couldn't go. And someone offered me, the show was sold out, and they offered me $20 per ticket. And I thought, wow, this was, you know, this was an amazing return, like 100% return. So I'd always been into to live entertainment. And you know, going to concerts was always my favorite thing to do. My dad, for my 15th birthday, took me to see Bon Jovi uh, open up the Prudential Center in New Jersey. 
That's so awesome. I'd always been, I'd always been into that. I went to a million Yankee games, you know, growing up and I just decided, you know what? I saw this return was good. I knew this, I knew the business. I didn't know the ins and outs of the business, but I knew, you know, what music was popular. I, you know, I kind of had my ear, you know, ear to it. I followed sports and still do really closely. So in the, just always wanting to, you know, start a big business, I said, you know what, let me go for it because I'm knowledgeable in the subject. And, you know, it just started growing and I haven't been in another industry since. That's cool. Yeah, it's a great way. I mean, you learn that lesson, you know, getting started uh, and, you know, and growing it from there. So we're going to talk a little bit about, more about the business and how you got things going as you get. But one of the things that you mentioned in the email and you mentioned here just right before we started the the show was uh, – reaching out to us because of how, how devastating it's been for you professionally. And I imagine, you know, personally as well, and how COVID has really shut down your entire business. And you, you made this comment that I really liked. You said, you know, picking yourself back up and moving on is not as easy as it sounds. And we talk about that a lot on the show. You know, Dave and I are these eternal optimists, but you know, it, it's great to talk to somebody that's gone through it and, uh, it sounds like you're getting through it and maybe even coming on the show and sharing your experience here is part of getting through that. Um, t- talk to us about what you've been through and how you're, how you're responding to it. Well, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, it was gone through multiple stages and I don't even want to sound like, you know, like a page at an AA or something, but <laughs> I think, you know, I think the first, you know, the first step was actually accepting that, you know, COVID is a real thing and it's going to be around for longer right. than any of us like. I think, yeah. at, you know, the very beginning when, you know, when we ultimately, you know, put the business on hold for a little bit and just stopped, we, I know our first step was we just stopped buying tickets because we just didn't know, you know, what was going to happen to, to anything. And, sure. you know, we're like, okay, is this going to last a month or two months? And, you know, me and myself, I'm a huge tennis fan. And I said, okay, well, they still have Wimbledon coming up and they're going to play Wimbledon. They've never not played Wimbledon. And then they cancel Wimbledon. And it's just like, okay, well, this is, you know, this is going to, you know, this is going to take a while. So, you know, I think the first part of it was, you know, accepting, you know, that this is going to be here for a while and there's nothing that I can personally do to bring it back. You know, me personally, like it's just going right. to be a matter of time. Yep. So then, you know, you kind of move on from that and you say, okay, well, as a business, you know, what do we do to keep the business going? I know the best thing about working at key investment group is, you know, being in a small business, the business is, you know, part of my family, you know, everyone who I work with, I'm incredibly close with. And, you know, we've spent, you know, we all put in a minimum of, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day, you know, working with this because it's all our passion. And we all, you know, we all love the business and, you know, having that time taken away of saying like, okay, well, my passion is, in the entertainment business and my hobbies are going to concerts and going to ball games. So, you know, where do you, you know, where do you move on from them? And, you know, a lot of people, you know, you kind of bring it, I know I was very fortunate enough in my first business that financially, you know, I'm okay. Like I, I did very well in my first business. So it's not like, you know, having a slow down a business, I didn't know where my next meal was coming from type of thing. But this is this is what I love to do. And, you know, having that taken away and just say, OK, well, I'm going to go pop into another business or I'm going to, you know, try to save this business and kind of, you know, overcompensate. I think, you know, I think that was the hardest part about, you know, I didn't know how to get back up. You know, I knew I was yeah. down, but I didn't know what direction yeah. to necessarily go in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, that that was a lot of people. <laughs> I think there's still a lot of people there, you know, that are that are going yeah. through similar things. Um, so I, I kind of, well, I feel like, you know, reading what you wrote and talking to you, is you maybe you've turned the corner. Like you said, there's different uh, steps here. Um, what have you, uh, what resources have you tapped and, you know, process or systems have you put in place to get you through those things as you work on, you know, either recovering the other business at some point or shifting to a new industry? Well, so, you know, I key investment group, you know, we're still, we're still alive. We're still running. I mean, obviously, you know, our sales aren't what they were in 
January and February. But I think, you know, one thing that we realized as a business and, you know, I think everyone else, no matter what business you're in, and I'm not even saying, you know, whether you own the business, whether you're an employee of the business is you should figure out what your company does and what your company knows. And without, you know, kind of beating a dead horse, how can you monetize it in a variety of different ways in case one of your avenues of revenue is cut off for any reason? So we were doing, you know, a key investment group. If you said, okay, what was our best three months as a company? It was, you know, December 2019, January 2020, and February 2020. I mean, we were just, you know, trending up and just becoming, you know, just, you know, just higher sales and hiring more people. But we never really thought about, okay, we consider ourselves ticketing experts and, you know, meet and greet and, you know, VIP experience experts, but we never really, we never really looked at, you know, entertainment as a whole, memorabilia, trading cards, you know, autograph, anything, you know, the pictures with this, you know, live, live, or sorry, virtual meet and greets. We never really looked at ourselves as entertainment experts. And now that we've kind of looked at that, we know what, you know, the most popular, you know, trading cards are. I mean, we've seen, you know, believe it or not, trading cards selling for 65000 to to $100,000 just for a single card. And, wow. you know, we, we didn't really look at ourselves as, as I just mentioned, as experts. And now, you know, we're coming in and it looks like we're turning a corner. You know, it looks like there's, you know, so-called an end, an end in sight. And now we have so many different avenues of this business that when we can come back, we can attack the ticketing side, the memorabilia side, the card side, and you know attack sports and music as a whole, not just in the ticket field. That's gonna that's gonna make you bigger than you would have been otherwise. I mean, potentially, right? Because you've had this moment to take a breath and say, "Wait, what do we do here? What are our who are our customers, and what else do they want that we can?" take our expertise and deliver. Yes. And, and, and to add on that, like, I know I have, you know, family members who are a little bit older and, you know, we always talk about music and they said, you know what, even if, you know, there's a vaccine, I might not be ready to go back to a concert right away. But my right. aunt is a, my aunt is a huge Almond Brothers fan. And she asked me if I can get her, you know, like a sign, you know, signed photos because she wants to hang them up in her house. And, you know, it's different things like that where, for people who you know may not want to go back to a concert right away, maybe we can give you memorabilia. So maybe you can be part of you know another part of our business. We know that ticketing is still going to be the biggest part of our business. We know that that's where our bread and butter is. But if we can just add other streams of revenue, just you know, just in case for whatever reason concerts get shut down again, you know, we still sure, have yeah. people. We still have another stream of of revenue. Totally makes okay, sense. Okay, I, I have a. I have a question I want to ask you, but the first thing that I want to do is talk about our two sponsors for today. All right. I am very excited here because our first sponsor today is a new sponsor, and that is issue.com slash podcast with promo code SBS. Listen, you live to create, but you don't live to worry over all the little nitpicky details involved in putting the final touches on your content, right? It takes just as much time to do that as it does to actually create the bulk of the content. Well, how about you do what you do best and let Issue handle the rest? Because Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute these beautiful digital publications. You can create like brochures and magazines, but also, of course, sales collateral and more. So because of that, it's perfect for marketers and designers and publishers and salespeople if you want to create eye-catching content, Issue is the place to go, and they make it super easy. You just upload your PDFs and your files, and Issue transforms them using your vision and customizable templates to let you create the content that you want, and you create it once and distribute it everywhere. Everything is optimized to post on your website and social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. They can even help you make animated Instagram stories. And the cool part is you can start using Issue for free. Very cool stuff. I, I had a chance to mess with this and it, God, it may make it so easy and you want to use it. So you can get started with Issue today for free. Or if you sign up for a premium account, you'll get 50% off. 
when you go to issue.com slash podcast and use promo code SBS. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use promo code SBS at checkout for your free account or 50% off your premium account. You choose, right? So that's issue, I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast with promo code SBS and our thanks to issue for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Text Expander. Look, the beauty of Text Expander is you can get it right every time. We prioritize here two things that are normally at odds with each other perfection and efficiency. Normally, you get one, right? You get to t get it done quickly and efficiently, or you get it done correctly and perfectly. Well, Text Expander is one of those weird tools. It's not weird, but it's weird in that it's rare because it gives you the opportunity to do both. What you do is you craft your written response. It could be an email. It could be like a text response that you use in your customer service stuff. It could be as simple as your address formatted the right way, a phone number or an FAQ, right? Somebody asks a question and that question could be, tell me about your prices for your products, right? Like that kind of thing might be the kind of response you want. You craft it once. Now you're already doing this because what you do is you craft it once without really thinking about it because you have to, and then you send it off. And then when somebody asks a similar question, you go into your sent folder, right? And you dig around until you can find it and you copy and you paste it. But now it's got the, the, the forwarding marks and the formatting and the things that you didn't really want. And so you spend time cleaning all that up and you get it right and you send it out again. And then it happens again. And again, with Text Expander, you do it once. You put it into Text Expander, and then the next time you need it, you just invoke it with a keystroke, Text Expander, and it expands it for you. Or you just choose it from a menu if you can't remember the keystroke. And, you know, eventually your hands will start to remember this stuff, and that's when you're good to go. You can share your snippets with your team and everything. It's awesome. Text Expander is available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, iPad. And because you're a listener of the Small Business Show, you get 20% off your first year. So visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more. And our thanks to Text Expander for sponsoring this episode. All right. So, Evan, I, and I realize there are no crystal balls here. And, you know, we've, we're at this point in time when we're recording this, there are, you know, vaccines potentially coming, but nothing's officially approved yet. We don't know the real timing. Like, it's all, you know, cloudy at best. <laughs> Less cloudy than it was months ago, but still, you know, we're not there. So with all of this in mind, I know Shannon and I, in, me, in addition to being a musician, I'd like to go to live events. I love going to concerts. I know Shannon likes to do that. Absolutely. What's your prediction as to when that will realistically be able to resume? I truly think it's going to be in around May or June because all the shows that were supposed to so we got through, or we, you know, the artists got through shows up until around the second week, second or third week of March. And then everything That's got right. pushed back until 2021. So right. for all those shows that were booked, they basically moved them, you know, same venue, almost same date, just the same year. So all these shows sure. that you were supposed to see this summer are now in place for next summer. That's now, all my tickets. All my tickets just say 2021 instead of 2020. Exactly. And the date and the dates, you know, are probably within, you know, a couple of days of each other. You know, yeah, it's usually within a week. Yeah. They, they tried to just sort of remap the take the map from this year and do it for next year. That's right. E yeah. Exactly. And the reason I think the shows have to happen in the summer is because. I don't know if they can push it back another summer because shows shows that happen at at out at outdoor amphitheaters, you know, they can really yeah. only happen in the summer. You know, you can't go, sure. it's tough to go see a show in, you know, New Jersey at an outdoor venue in January. Like it's just, yeah, it's, it's, just not a, it's not, a, it's not fun unless it's a football game and then people don't seem to mind, but yeah, you know, for, otherwise for, true. for whatever reason, football, you know, for whatever reason, football has defined that for, it's for, true. A, for years to come. You know, the funny thing is I'm, I'm up in Tahoe right now and they have a festival in the middle of winter here called Snow Globe and my kids yeah. go to it and it's like, yeah. now, of course, they're not doing it this year. So it's like there's there's unique <laughs> events that maybe could do that. But uh, for the most part, you're right. So so Mike, because Mark Geiger uh, involved in the live entertainment business for a long time, Lollapalooza founder, I think, yeah. and uh, other things. He says it's going to be 2022 that we come out of what he calls the the um, 
the quarantine economy and enter what he calls the claustrophobia economy, which is moving from we must stay in our house to we need to leave our house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, but I think whenever it is, I think it's going to be party central out there. Wh whatever, yes. whenever we heal to the point that we're comfortable touching each other again, I think it's going to be create the roaring 20s like we've never seen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be, I mean, we're planning to get back and just be as busy as could be because I think, you know, one of the things that has, you know, and again, you say talk about in the show being optimist. One of the things that I've looked at as, you know, the glass half full type thing is that live entertainment now is needed more than ever and people need to get out. Right. I know there are certain, I, I look at it right now and I look at certain businesses like hotels. And I know my mother travels a lot for business. I mean, she used to travel at least twice a week. I'm not sure if she's ever going to travel at the same rate because you can just mm. get on a, you could just get on a zoom call or get on a phone call for, you know, meetings that yeah, aren't that, necessarily. That part has changed for sure. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah. think, and then the other benefit that I think of is I think more than ever, you know, going forward, working from home, working remote, working wherever is convenient for you is going to be more acceptable going forward. And I think that's very, very important for the live entertainment business because I know I used to, you know, when I'd go up to my office, it was around, you know, a 45 minute commute. And I had friends who I lived with who, you know, had to drive same thing, 45 minutes, an hour to go to work in the morning. Now there'd be a show on a Wednesday night that I would want to go to, but I know one of my roommates would say, uh, you know, I don't really, it's, I kind of want to go, but I don't want to go enough to get home at midnight and then get up at six 30 in the morning and then go to work. But right. if it, if it could be a thing where he could work from home the next day and get up at, you know, eight and roll out oh, and be at a desk at eight fifteen, and you know you can necessarily work from home the day after you want to go to a big event i think it will force you know more people to go and then once you start getting into the live entertainment experience then i think you know your work the next day kind of you know you you slowly yeah. forget about it it's just about yeah. getting it's just about getting to the show and then you know you have maybe another beer you have more food at the show you buy a t-shirt and that just helps the overall, I'll call it the overall concert economy. And, you know, it yeah. just keeps, keeps everything going. But I think going forward, live entertainment is going to come out of this pandemic better positioned than a lot of other businesses. I think that's true. I, I, I well, it, it and, and the services businesses as well will, I mean, they, they're, it, they've all, like you said, you've all been given this you've been forced, but I always like to look at things as opportunities, this opportunity to pause and reevaluate, right? Because you have to. And, and at some level, once things do start to reopen, there's a rebuilding that will happen, right? Because most companies didn't keep everybody on the payroll, you know, so you, you kind of relook at it and say, if we were to do it again, how would we do it differently? And that question just as a byproduct of this gets answered. So, yeah. Yeah. And I want to touch on, you mind if I just jump back? I want to touch on yeah. one other thing that we brought up. I know we talked about, you know, when does live entertainment come back and when do concerts come back? And I think, you know, a lot of things that, that people aren't taking into consideration is, you know, I'll listen to someone go, oh, like I would happily go to a concert right now, but like, why can't they do a concert, you know, social distancing, you know, why can't I go to an arena show? And instead of there being 15,000 people, have there be 5,000 people. And, you know, for anyone listening who I know, because I know I've been asked that question a lot, I just want to answer that. Uh, the toughest thing that I see that that other people aren't understanding is when you go to a, a show, you know, there's so much that you expect. You expect the lighting show. You expect the noise. There's so much other stuff that there's so many more people working than just the artist. And if you're going to a show at a third of the capacity, you're not expecting a third of the experience. So for musical artists, it's very difficult for them to, you know, put on a show and have it be as profitable as it would be because they need to provide the full experience and they can't do that only selling a third of the tickets. Yeah, that's that a good point. I've, yeah. I've done some shows and I, I've got some professional musician friends that are, you know, full. That's what they do for their income. And they've been able to make things work, but it's always with a skeleton crew. And like you said, not the full experience. And you have to be really careful what that does to your brand going forward. 
uh, because if that's part of the show and part of what pe- what entertains people, you know, when you go to a concert, you think, oh, that band was great. Well, it may be. But if all you saw was that band with, you know, a couple of spotlights on them, would you have been as entertained? Are they that good? Or the, does the lights help? Do the, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's the yeah. picture for you? Yeah. I mean, there's so much to, to a show. And I mean, obviously, if you look at the, you know, the Super Bowl, which is any show mm. on, you know, essentially steroids, think about how much that's going on at the Super Bowl. I mean, think about last year with Jennifer Lopez and, you know, Shakira. I mean, yeah. there were dancers, there were lights, there were, you know, different instruments being brought up. I mean, these artists are, you know, essentially corporations and they have, you know, a staff that needs to put on the show. I mean, think of everyone who, you know, even scans your ticket at the door. How many people that is on a, on a given night if you go to an arena or a stadium? And you're not going to wait on a line three times as long. Right. You know, yeah, sure. it's, it's these right. things where we take them for granted, but, you know, it, it, goes, it, goes, it goes into the show. And an artist, as you said, doesn't want to devalue their product if they can wait nine months and have a full tour at, you know, the normal capacity and not devalue their product. Right. Yeah, totally totally right. makes sense. Yeah. And, I, and I, w- I want to go back and just make comment on, you know, the, uh, you were describing moving into other areas, the memorabilia, different things like that. It, it's such a great way to build on the credibility that your business has already established in that relationship with customers that already trust you. Um, and, and it is often, you know, a uh, crisis th- that forces you to think like that to start developing different revenue streams. So I, I really commend you guys for working to come up with that. And I would highly recommend it, you know, uh, other folks out there that are, you know, having a heck of a time going through it is look at ways that you can reach your cu- existing customer base and offer them other services that they may be looking for. It's great advice. Yeah. And the one thing I would even add on that is think about that before you need it. So <laughs> of course. We think of, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't think of, yeah, I mean, obviously yeah. looking back, but we didn't, you know, we didn't think about it before we needed it. And then right. you have everyone else in the industry kind of scrambling and everyone is, you know, sometimes you make decisions under pressure and you make good decisions. And sometimes you make decisions under pressure and they're not as good decisions. So, you know, if you can have a plan kind of, you know, planned out to where, you know, if you need to implement this, you can implement this right away while everyone else is still scrambling. It'll, you know, it'll put your business leaps and bounds. Yeah, we've talked about else. here, uh, we did a whole show, I think, about the post-mortem of really analyzing uh, something, you know, that has gone south or, you know, what happened and this kind of thing. And it's almost like you need to exercise that and say, okay, well, what happened? What would happen if our main revenue stream turned off tomorrow? And of course, before COVID, everybody, oh, that'll never happen. Well, now, you know, uh, (laughs) and you can kind of maybe force that that crisis mode and and get you thinking along different ways. It's great. Um, So what... Yeah, one of the things you mentioned to me that that I, I really liked is that you know I, I you've been a company founder and you've also been an employee uh, again, and so for those of us that haven't been on the employee side of things for a number of decades, what insight has you know being on both sides of the table uh, given to you when you're working with other you know your either your employees or you know other other folks in your organization? So you know a couple things. You know the one thing about being about being an employee is, you know, owning a business, you understand that your, your founder has laid so much out on the table for you to even be able to have, to even be able to have a job. And, you know, I don't, you know, I know other employees, you know, you almost kind of take things for granted, you know, knowing what a founder has put in the blood, sweat and tears that they've put into the business to even have the ability to hire you is, is something that should never go unnoticed. But I, I think the other thing is that even when I've hired people, it's made it easy for me to hire people who work under me because I understand as a founder that you need to delegate tasks that you aren't as good at and bring people in who kind of supplement your weakness or sorry, complement your weakness. Yeah. So if you're not very organized, you know, Make sure you hire someone very, very organized. If you're weak on accounting, you know, you aren't as, you know, financially savvy, hire, you know, the most book savvy person you can find. And, you know, kind of being 
on that side of things, you know, being able to know what to look for has helped me tremendously. It sounds like being a founder has made you a much better employee. It, it has because I appreciate, you know, I appreciate both sides of this. And, you know, I, I get, I get the, you know, the so-called, you know, gripes of being an employee, you know, you know, why should I, you know, why should I work when my boss gets a dollar? Why should I work for a dime type right. thing? And, you know, you, you know, I, I understand that, you know, the founder has laid out so much for you to, for you to be able to even get that dime that you should be able you should give everything you have to them. And then working in a small business, you can grow and really rise up the ranks so much quicker that if you give it all to your founder, it's something that, you know, never goes unnoticed. That's cool. It's true. It's a great yeah, advice. What, yeah, it's, what an interesting thing. Yeah. We often say, you know, I, I use the term about myself and I say, you know, I'm patently unemployable. I, I wonder if that would be true in the future. Like it was true yeah, in maybe the past. And, yeah. and that's why I started and started doing what I, what I do. But listening to you, it's like, oh yeah, there's that empathy that you would naturally have as long as the person's a good, good leader and, and a good founder. If they're not, then that would be really frustrating on a variety of levels. Uh, but, but, you know, presuming that they know what they're doing. Yeah. That's interesting. It might, it might actually work out really well. Yeah, you never know. You could get a job. Yeah, someday. And I think, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, and I think if you have, I think if you have a founder who's, you know, open, I've been able to give our CEO and CFO advice, you know, of things that employees may be thinking because, yeah. you know, they just haven't been, you know, close enough to the situation. Or yeah, sometimes as sure. a founder, you're just, you're just in your own world and, you know, you're working on a, on a topic that, you know, necessarily you don't see and you don't always see what's going on to you. And being an employee has also made me, I think, a better, you know, founder, you know, or sure. would be a better yeah. founder because I now, you know, kind of say, okay, here's what everyone's going for. And even when I think I'm doing big business, I should look out for every little piece of business that's going on and make sure all concerns are being addressed. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it both ways. Uh, yep. That's pretty insightful. I, I, I'm, I'm really glad we, we brought that yeah, up. Kind of blowing that. my mind here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. I mean, we say, you know, we, you've heard us say before, we always learn the most. So, you know, we're just I'm sitting here like, okay, great. Oh, yeah, I have to ask another question, but I'm still absorbing that. <laughs> it's powerful. Um, <laughs> one of the things I liked about, you know, your story as well is that when, you know, the ticketing parts of the business, you it needed much less of your time. And then uh, you t- took on another role as president CEO of another small business since everything slowed down a bit. How did that come about? Um, you know, did the opportunity find you or did you find it? Um, how, how did that work? Well, it was, you know, it was actually a job that a job that I got offered, you know, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know whether or not the live, you know, the live ticketing business was coming back. And I just kind of wanted to, you know, put my foot out there and, you know, in a sense, keep my skill sharp for, Mm. you know, for when this business comes back and, you know, be able to take what I've learned from the entertainment business and, and move it over. And, you know, I, I ended up getting offered a role as, you know, president and CEO of a smaller company and actually, I actually turned the position down. And I really, you know, at the time I really wanted the position, but I knew no matter what my heart at that time was in the entertainment business. And it was my heart and my loyalty belonged to Key Investment Group because we've grown so much together. And, you know, we've kind of not by our doing has kind of been knocked off a cliff and you know i want to be there with the team to get back up so sure you know so i didn't think it was right to to take an opportunity with already one foot out the door if that makes sense knowing yeah, that, that okay i'll take i'll take this role but you know the first time a tour gets announced i'm out the door right but right. I, I, yeah, right, I really yeah. you know i really you know wanted to to look at and say, okay, what other opportunities would there be outside of, you know, live entertainment? I've 
you know, I started my business when I was 19 years old. I had a summer internship with the Brooklyn Nets that summer. And outside of that, I've never worked out of, and I guess that's considered entertainment. I've never worked out of the entertainment space. So I just almost wanted to see what else, you know, what else was out there and where do my skills translate best? And, you know, I've been able to take so much about being a leader and again, being a founder and being employee that I found that, you know, I would be a valuable asset, I think, to a lot of, or I know I'd be a valuable asset to a lot of different businesses, which, you know, is something that I think when we, you know, when we talked about earlier about, you know, picking yourself up, part of that I was able to pick myself, part that I was able to pick myself was up was like, you know what, God forbid if the entertainment business you know, dies for whatever reason, I'm a valuable asset in, in many other businesses. So that honestly, really getting that job offer, even though I didn't take the position, helped me bounce back more than anything. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And, you know, I always talk about as, as founders and business owners, you really have to learn to pat yourself on the back because you're off, you're constantly you know, rewarding other people and growing your team. And, and you have to find ways that are going to motivate you and, and lift yourself up. And I, I think that is a, a really good way or a good thing to recognize that, hey, I'm valuable. No matter what happens, I'm going to go and find something, uh, whether, you know, we turn around here or, or do something else. I, I think that's great. So, yeah, and I, and I think, oh, okay. sorry to cut you no, off. No, go ahead. Just add one more thing. I think, yeah, I, think no matter what, I think no matter what industry you're working in, you, you should always work on your business skills and, you know, just again, like different things that you could pick up, you know, client relations, no matter what business you're in, you know, if you have a client making sure that you care deeply about them and they feel that you're selling them more than just a product, skills like that can translate and have you be successful in any industry that you know, any yeah. industry that you go into. We talk oh, about, we, we, we yeah, always we like, say every business is the customer service business. Yeah. So, th- you know, you, <laughs> you just nailed it. That's yeah, it. And you're yeah. building, you're building your talent stack that you're going to carry mm. with you your entire life, no matter what you do, what company you start, whether you work for someone else, that, that talent stack is, is what is going to make you successful. Cause if you're just good at one thing and you, it, it usually doesn't work out right. So that it's, it's good to recognize. Um, That's perfectly so, good. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we love mistakes on the show. We, you know, we've written a book about it. Uh, we, uh, can you share a mistake that you made along the way? Something that stuck with you and taught you a lesson you'll never forget. Yeah, I think you know, I think the biggest mistake I made, and you know, it, it's not going to sound like you know necessarily a big one at the beginning, but it actually led me to sell my business. Was when I started my business, I was afraid to let other people into the business that weren't family. So when I was, you know, when I first started the business, there was nothing at the beginning that I was doing that was proprietary. I just was really going off my knowledge and, you know, keeping really, really tight books and keeping logs of, you know, days that tickets were bought, you know, how much, how many tickets were being bought per day versus, you know, you know, the distance away from the Mm -hmm. show. But there was nothing I was doing that, you know, I could trademark or that I could patent. So I was afraid to say, okay, well, if I let someone, you know, work for me who's very smart, they're going to, you know, take everything I teach them and run. And so at the so I hired, you know, hired, I hired my dad to do my accounting. I hired, you know, my sister and her friends to help me, you know, buy tickets and, you know, call different promoters and, you know, hired, you know my grandfather to help me, you know, with, you know, reaching different vendors. And as great as every, my family was who worked for me, I didn't have anyone with any experience in the entertainment business. So I wasn't learning anything new about the business. Everything that everyone who worked for me knew, it was something that I told them or something that I had taught them. So in the end of 2016, through all of 17, all of 2017, my business, in a sense, flatlined because I was unwilling to, you know, trust outside people. And I'm not sure if, 
you know, obviously working for Key, for Key Investment has been, you know, one of the best decisions that I've ever made. But I don't know if my business, you know, if I necessarily would have sold it if I didn't, you know, in a sense, limit myself. Right. Yeah, that that's it's great insight. And it is very difficult. And I, uh, we've had lots of people on the show, and this has happened to me as well, where you do train people and they they don't they go out and start their own their own businesses and different things. Um, it's it's a tough thing, and everybody manages it uh, in a different way. But uh, yeah, I I found that my I think my initial hesitation was less about the fear of someone coming in and taking what I taught them and leaving. It was someone coming in and telling me that I had been doing it wrong because they had more experience and they were actually smarter than me. And once I got, yeah. well, well, I'm just being honest, right? And once right. I got over that, I was like, well, of, of course I want them. If they're yeah. actually smarter than me, of course I want them in my business to tell me how to do things better. Yes. That's that's why you pay them, that's Dave. Right. That's right. You know, but but that's a hard thing when when you're like, nope, I can do it because because as an entrepreneur you are forced to ignore the doubters at some level and at different times, right? It, Always, it's just yeah. how it goes. And so that mindset, you know, if you don't compartmentalize and control it, it, it controls you, right? And it's like, oh, no, I have to be the one that knows the most about this. Otherwise, that shatters everything that, that, I, that I stand on here, right? You know, so. I mean, yeah. that's exactly right. I know at, at Key Invisible Group and around September of, or maybe August of 2019, I hired you know a computer science major or a computer science uh, student who just had graduated, and you know at first I was nervous. I go, wow, you know, you always think anyone in computer science is you know just automatically smarter than you are because they can do things that you don't even comprehend. And he he was able to open my eyes to to so many different things about you know different what was being researched throughout different cities and he was able to expand the business and just help us grow so much but i know for ticket insider my business i never would have hired a computer science major i said this guy's you know so much smarter than i am and you know he definitely can take what i do and automate it and you know knock me out of the water but you know then he became you know in a sense my right hand person and you know, we were able to to help grow the business together because of different things that he was skilled at. But one thing I didn't take into consideration, and as much as I, you know, respect him, he was just there to do a job. And he just, you know, there were certain aspects that it takes to run a business that I know he just didn't have. Sure. And that's what complemented yeah. us. So that's what complemented us so well, because we were able to just rely on each other's strengths. To where had I hired him, had I hired another, you know, computer science major, I could have helped grow Ticket Insider. But I think my fear and my mistake of saying, you know what, not let's not get the best people around me, you know, really yeah, hindered me. Very common, man. Yeah. <sighs> we, I, we, we have all been there. And it, and it is, uh, it, a lot of it is fear of what, you know, what's going to happen or what could happen, losing control. I think it's some great insight that you can look back on it now and, and talk about it uh, and it will serve you well, you know, for the rest of your career. That, that, that's for sure. It's uh, great. So Evan, thank, thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to ask you one more question before we go. We're really in this, uh, this kick for uh, 2020 since there's so much inaction going on and we're all kind of in many ways sitting on our hands, waiting for things to turn around. But uh, is there, if there was some, action item you could recommend for, you know, small business owners out there listening, especially in industries like yourself that are just kind of whole on hold, what would you recommend they do something today that could help them, uh, you know, make it through this stuff? That's a good question. I would, you know, I would touch on earlier and, I'll, and maybe I'll expand on something I said earlier, you know, have another, you know, have another stream of, of revenue and maybe even have it, you know, in a sense, offset your, your core business. So, so for example, right now uh, I have a good friend of mine who, who owns a restaurant and his best dish is, is macaroni and cheese. And it's his number one seller. And he says, you know, his number two item is not even close. So what I told him is they said, you know, why don't you, you know, take it up. Why don't you, you know, box your mac and cheese and try to get it into supermarkets. 
And he goes, no, man, like, that's crazy. I'm going to devalue, you know, I'm going to devalue my product. It's not going to look as, you know, it's not going to taste as good. The presentation is, isn't going to be as good. And my margins in the supermarket are just going to be so much tighter than, than they would be, you know, if someone came to my, you know, came to my store, or, sorry, came to my restaurant. And now you look at where we are on, you know, November 24th, indoor dining has been, you know, essentially eliminated for the next five weeks, if, if not further. And, you know, for him being, you know, if he had his dish in a supermarket, he could have a whole new avenue to get sales and then have those people, in a sense, come back to his restaurant when things reopen. So my one piece of advice is, you know, again, figure out what your core competency is, figure out, you know, what makes you better than your competition and just try to you know, monetize it in as many different ways without, you know, completely devaluing your business. No, that's great. It's great advice. Uh, you know, some really great tips today. And, and I just want to thank you again for coming on the show, sharing your story, being, you know, open and authentic about it. Um, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you uh, and to learn more about your business? I think the best way, I mean, um, I've been right now and, you know, you talk about like different ways you can find, you know, inspiration, even the way I found both of you guys is, you know, just reach out to me on, on LinkedIn, uh, first name, Evan, E-V-A-N, uh, last name, Samet, S-A-M-E-T. And I would love to talk about, you know, any business questions or any, you know, entertainment related questions. And I've been actually through LinkedIn, just, you know, finding a lot of different stories and finding, you know, finding you guys and, you know, having great conversations, which as you stated earlier, has helped me, you know, have a more positive outlook on things. And if I could help, you know, someone else have another positive outlook or give any piece of advice, you know, that's all I want to do. Yeah. That's awesome, man. We really appreciate it. We, we wish you the best. Uh, please keep us posted on how things are going. Um, we'd love to have you come back on the show when things turn around and you can share how awesome, uh, things are going for you. And, uh, thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Thank you guys for having me. This was a lot of fun. Man, I, what a what a refreshing interview to do because it was just a conversation. And I, not yeah. that I not that I mind any of our others, but you know, like he said, most people have Different. something they're pro- actively promoting when they're yes. doing the interview circuit. And he just wanted to. He was promoting help, which I thought yeah. and and it, optimism, which is even better. Right. Yep. And and I what I I really you know we I get pitched a lot uh, every oh, you know dude. every day someone wants to come on the show and i'm really uh you know well okay what do they offer to our listeners oh, and yeah. this kind of thing and you try to you know i get kind of, i get five of them and, a day that i don't even send to you it's like oh yeah it's, it's i'm sure worth it. and so yeah. <laughs> when he came in i was like well you know really he it, two things he wants to share his experience so that it could help someone else but at the same time like i pointed in the show i think it's helping him get through this as well right yes. talking about these things and just you know, like I, for I you know, and me yeah just like for us and so it's just a, it is a great uh tool if you will to put into your your toolbox add to your system uh to have being able to engage and, and we're not able to do that as much as we were uh, eight or nine months ago. And it may not be for a while. So it was great. I really enjoyed having them on. And uh, I, I, I learned a lot as, as usual. Oh, yeah. That, that, this was fantastic. So, so much fun and so nice to just kind of dive right in. So, yes. folks, if you have any thoughts, questions, if you want to come on the show, but even if you don't, even if you just want to share your optimism by way of us reading it or your your troubles and your problems, like we're happy to answer your questions too. Feedback at businessshow.co. We definitely want to hear from you. It really, th- these conversations, you know, Evan came to us as a listener, right? It, it this, this is what we do this for so that we can all work together as a community. And that's what, that's why we started this. So th- yeah, feedback at businessshow.co. Please, we'd awesome. love to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks so much for listening. Yep. Uh, yeah. If, uh, if you're in the U.S. and you're listening to this before Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. Keep living that charmed life. We'll see you next time.